scripture passage I'd like to read for you tonight is one that you know very well. I'm going to be reading tonight the, from the second chapter of the book of Ephesians. And I'm going to begin reading with verse 1. And unless you are reading from the um, New Living Translation, which one of our former professors at Wesley Biblical Seminary, Dr. John Oswalt, was quite instrumental in translating from Hebrew the Old Testament. Uh, this may sound a little different to you. I will then go back and reread some passages from the King James so that you'll have a little more, uh, perhaps a little more uh, recognizable resonance in what we're going to be preaching about tonight. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Once you were dead in your trespasses and sins because of your many sins. You used to live just like the rest of the world, full of sin, obeying Satan, the mighty prince of the power of the air. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passions and desires of our evil nature. We were born with a nature like that. And we were under God's anger just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy and He loved us so very much that even while we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Jesus Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ, and we are seated with him in heavenly places, all because we are one with Christ Jesus. And so God can always point to us as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all that he has done for us through Jesus Christ. God saved you by his grace when you believed through faith. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So no one can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good works He planned for us long ago. And then just a couple of these verses from the King James. Same chapter. Same reference. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, wherein past time you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is at work in the children of, the, of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, he made us alive, he quickened us together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I have to tell you, every time I ever drive past Kosciuszko exit off the trace, or I see the signs on the 25 for Kosciuszko, or I see a sign off of 55 for Kosciuszko. I'm reminded, because, you know, when you see the word Kosciuszko, 
for the first time in your life? Nobody knows exactly what to call the name of the town where you are from, right? I remember looking at it one time for about, I stopped the car just to look at it and I thought, I have no idea. My little boy was sitting there and he was learning how to read. He said, Dad, is, is that Coscui Costco? And I said, no, you're, but that's probably close. I, you know. <laughs> but it, remind, it reminds me of a joke I heard once about another place. There were these two young men who were driving up Interstate 75. They were coming from Georgia and headed to Detroit. Michigan, or as we say where I come from in the hills of Virginia, Detroit City. They were headed from Georgia to Detroit City. And as they were coming up I-75, you come up through Georgia, Tennessee, into Kentucky, you get to Cincinnati, and there you continue on up 75 through Dayton. And when you get to Dayton, in between Dayton and Detroit City, there's a little town, a little city. Well, one of these young men had grown up as a missionary kid in Peru, and the other was a farm boy from South Georgia. They knew each other in college, and as they were driving along, they came to this city that I just mentioned. And the boy who was driving the car was the young man who had been a missionary kid in Peru. And he looked and he said, oh my goodness, here we are, driving along in Ohio, and we are about to go through a town that is named after the capital city of the country that I grew up in, Lima, Peru. Here we are in Lima, Ohio. The little boy from Georgia said, well, son... I'm not from these parts, but I'll guarantee you one thing. We're in the United States of America, and they have not named their city for the capital city of the country you grew up in. This is not Lima, Ohio. If anything, this town is named for the beans they grow in the state where I come from. This is Lima, Ohio. The boy from Peru said, what do you know? You're a Georgia cracker. These are sophisticated northerners up here. You know good and well they've named it for a beautiful city like Lima. The boy said, it can't be Lima, son. It's got to be Lima. No, it's Lima. No, it's Lima. It's Lima. It's Lima. Finally, the boy who was driving the car, the missionary kid, he said, oh, I tell you what, we'll settle this right now. And he wheels off the next exit he comes to, drives down to the bottom of the exit ramp, turns right, turns into the parking lot of the first establishment they get to, they both jump up out of the car and race to the front door. They burst through the front door and they run up to the counter where there's a young, startled young woman standing there and the boy from Georgia gets to the counter first and he leans over and says, ma'am, I'm sorry to startle you, but we need a favor from you if you don't mind. She said, well, what is it? He said, I need you to say in very clear, very slow English right now for this boy here the name of where we are right now. Well, she thought it was an odd request, but she was wanting to be helpful, so she leaned over and she said, Burger King. <laughs> well, it's always good to know where you are, right? And as Christians, one of the things that it is very easy for us to forget is really where we live, spiritually speaking. You know, when you've been a Christian long enough, we sing songs sometimes that remind us of things but we don't we no longer feel the depth of their reality for instance when you sing a song like amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me when's the last time you ever felt that you had ever been a wretch 
I mean, honestly. God knows. So don't try to pretend just because you're in church. Say, oh, yes, sir. When you walk with the Lord and the Lord has cleaned you up, the Lord's improved your life, the Lord has given you values and convictions that you live by, you don't feel like a wretch, do you? It's okay. You can say, we don't. We sing the song, it moves us, but we, we no longer feel what the grace of God really means in our lives. As a matter of fact, because we no longer feel what the grace of God means in our lives, we often think, we often reduce grace down to simply God giving us a second chance because He sent Jesus, and so He will forgive us of our sins. We just turn grace into nothing more than the offer of forgiveness. But my friends, tonight, this moment, sitting in this beautiful sanctuary, here on this hill in Kosciuszko. See, I've learned how to say it. I think. If I've said it wrong, you can correct me. Everything about your life, everything about my life, everything about our lives is nothing but the product of God's grace. God's grace was not something you got a long time ago that brought you into salvation. God's grace is what we live in every single moment of our lives. Sinners need God's grace. And Christians need God's grace. But I want us to think tonight Two things. I'd like for us to be able to think about what grace really is. What is God's grace really? Is it just is it something more than just his special favor? His giving us a second chance? Is it something more than his unmerited favor toward us? Yes, it is. But what is grace? And exactly as we sit here tonight, no longer people filled with sin, how is it that we might reimagine and re-understand why it is that we can only, even you and me sitting here tonight, you and I only can be saved by grace. For by grace are you saved. Paul doesn't say, for by grace were you saved through faith. He says, for by grace are you saved. Present tense. Are, right now, this moment, by grace are you being saved through faith. Why is it that we need God's grace to save us? And in order to do that, I'd like for you to walk with me through this passage. And I'll do this as quickly as I can. But I'd like for us to just look at a couple of things. First is that Paul, as he writes to the church here at Ephesus, he says to them, you need to remember something. You need to remember that apart from God, you were dead in sin. Dead in sin. Now, that's a concept we need to think about just a moment. Dead in sin. I don't know if you've ever heard people argue about this sometimes, but I've, ha I've had many people argue, uh, want to talk with me about human beings. I said, do you believe human beings are basically good or are they basically evil? People who think they're basically good have a hard time explaining where all the evil comes from. Right? If human beings are basically good, how is there so much bad and evil in the world? You know, that old book that was out in the 70s, a psychiatrist wrote a book called I'm Okay and You're Okay. 
some wag asked the question. He said, well, if I'm okay and you're okay, who is it that's causing all this ruckus out here in the world? People who believe we're just basically good, they have a hard time explaining where evil comes from. And people who think that human beings are nothing but evil through and through, they have a hard time explaining why it is that even unbelievers can sometimes do acts of such enormous beauty and goodness that it makes our mouths drop open. How an atheist fireman in New York City could run up the steps of the World Trade Center risk his life to save complete strangers if we're just evil. Where does that come from? Well, I think we have a hard time answering the question if we put it in those terms, are we good or are we evil? Because the Bible doesn't say we're either one. Ultimately, what the Bible wants us to know is this. The heart of mankind may be wicked, but it's wicked because we have an even more fundamentally important problem. On our own, if God, by His grace, did not act in our lives, on our own, if He just left us to our own devices, we would be dead to God. We would be dead to the reality of our need for God. You see, there's something about human sinfulness that can cause us to be so self-interested that we never really come to understand how it is that we need God. You know, you can say, well, anybody can look up into the starry heavens, or anybody can look at the ocean, or anybody can look at a newborn child, or anybody can look at the wonder of this world, and you know somebody must have made it, right? But let me ask you a question. Do you think you could ever figure out on your own just by looking at the starry heavens, just by looking at your child or your grandchild, just by thinking about the wondrous complexity of the universe and the wondrous complexity even of the human body, could you just by looking at those things ever figure out that the God who made those things actually is interested in you. And that the God who made the whole universe says, listen, you need to live your life according to my will. Would we figure that out on our own? I don't think so. There's one thing that looking at the universe can't tell me. It cannot tell me that the God who made all that made me to know Him and to serve Him. If God left us to our own devices, we would be dead to our need for God. Now, I've never been dead at least not in my recollection. But I have been deeply asleep. You know, in the, in the Middle Ages, they referred to death as the dreamless sleep. And they referred to sleep as the dream-filled death. Because when you go to sleep, the, in the Middle Ages, they saw it as a reminder that someday we are all going to die. Because when we're deeply asleep, we are absolutely unaware of things going on around us when we're really deeply asleep. We're just dead to the world. You've heard that phrase before, right? He's so asleep, he's just dead to the world. Monks in the Middle Ages used to sleep in little boxes that when they died... They would nail the coffin lid 
on top of the box and bury them in the box that they've been sleeping in. That should give you comfort tonight when you're brushing your teeth, getting ready uh, to close your eyes for the evening. But my point is just this. We, none of us may know what it's like to be dead, but we know what it's like to be unaware. Unaware of the things that are going on around us. When I was in college, I was, see, I had the spiritual gift of sleep. I, I'm like, I got it from my father, you know. My father is, was even better at it than I am. He could almost sleep at will, just decide he was going to go to sleep. I'm not quite that talented, but I could sleep. When I was in college, I could really sleep. One night, I was in my dormitory, and some bonehead about 3.30 in the morning got this brilliant idea that it would be a fun prank to pull a fire alarm. Fire alarm went off. This Blaring horn. Ba -wah! Ba -wah! Ba -wah! The whole dorm emptied out into the street. The dorm res the head resident came and started taking everybody's names. Where is everybody? Everybody's accounted for except Blakemore. Where's Blakemore? Well, I don't know, he was in the dorm. They came up, pounded on my door for a little while. The siren was right over my door. And I was asleep. You see, I was unaware of my me. There was no fire, but nobody knew that, right? If it were not for God's grace in a person's life, you and I are not smart enough to figure out on our own <coughs> that we really need God in our lives. Oh, we're smart enough to know that we need something more than ourselves, but we're not smart enough to ever figure out what it is that exactly we need. So if tonight you sit here and you know in your heart that you need God, and you know in your heart that God through Jesus Christ has made Himself real and available to you, if you know that, we can't pat ourselves on the back and say, look at us. Aren't we special? It's only the grace of God that has made you alive to know that. So not only, but not only do we not know that we have a need, the truth is, even if we come to realize what our need before God really is, we can't really fix the problem. It's really interesting the way some people think about God when they begin to realize that they need the Lord. Or that the Lord is going to judge them someday. People often think something like this. Well, you know, I know I've done, I know I have this list of bad things I've done over here on this side of the ledger sheet. But on this side of the ledger sheet, I've done some pretty good things. And besides, on the bad side of the ledger sheet, my list is not nearly as long as some people's. I mean, my goodness gracious, when you consider what some people have done, I am really not that bad off. And people believe that somehow, when we turn to the Lord, what the Lord is actually going to be doing is sort of weighing the balances. How much good is there in your life versus how much wrong is there in your life? And someday when we stand before Him, hopefully God will tip the scales in our favor. But you know, my friends, our problem before God the need that we really have before God is not that we've done some bad things and not enough good things. Our problem spiritually, according to the Scripture, is not that we have broken God's law. That's not what sin is. Of course human beings have broken God's law and broken God's commandments. And human beings have done it, and still do it, and sometimes some of the human beings doing it are the ones 
singing hymns in church on Sunday morning. Of course human beings have broken God's law. But that's not our problem before God. The scriptures tell us a story about humanity. It tells us the story of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, the first humans, but also representing all humans. God gives them everything, including himself. And you know what Adam and Eve say? We love the garden. We love everything that you've given us. But you know what, God? We think we know best for our lives. We're going to take the tree that you told us to stay away from. And we're going to use it the way we want to. Right? God said that tree will kill you. They said it's good to eat. It's as though human beings say about God. Thank you for our life. Thank you for the world. Thank you for everything. But no thank you for you. Why don't you just stay in your place? You see, the truth is, friends, human sin is more like betrayal than it is disobedience. Did you hear me? Human sin is more like betrayal than it is disobedience. And you know what the truth is about betrayal? When the human race betrays God as God, the human race says, we're not going to let you be God in our lives. We're going to be gods for ourselves. We betray God. And you know, as well as I do, when it comes to betrayal, that there is nothing that the betrayer can ever do to restore a relationship with the person betrayed. Let me tell you a little story. It's just a made-up story, but it'll illustrate, I think, for us this principle. Imagine that there's this young man, and he's born into a very wealthy family, and his parents loved him, doted on him, gave him every advantage, not only gave him a lot of things, but they gave him their time and their encouragement throughout his whole life. But as, they, as he grew older, he got tired of waiting on his inheritance. Instead of waiting on his inheritance, he decided that when the opportunity came, he was going to take what he felt like was his anyway. And so when mom and dad go on their 40th anniversary trip on a world tour, because they're very wealthy, their son figures out how he can extort and embezzle all of their money. He gets it all. Puts it in his name. He leaves a note at mom and dad's dining room table which says, Dear mom and dad, I was tired of waiting on you to die to get my inheritance, so I've just taken it all. It was going to come to me anyway. Have a nice life. And he leaves. Ten years go by. During that ten years, this young man has more than doubled what he stole from his parents. In that time, he got married. Married a beautiful young woman. They have two beautiful children. Somewhere in his heart, he begins to say, I wish that my children could know their grandparents. And besides, I can go back to my parents and apologize, and I can give them more than I took from them. I can make it all up to them. So he loads his family up in his car. They drive cross country, pull up to the little cottage that mom and dad have to live in because he took everything that belonged to them. He takes his beautiful family and they're holding hands. They walk up the sidewalk. He walks up to the front door and he knocks on the front door. Can't find a place to knock. 
On the other side of the door, you can hear the sound of old feet shuffling to come and open the door. He's standing there with his family, and the doorknob begins to turn, and then it begins to open. Now let me ask you something in all reality, given that story that I just told you, made up. It's an exaggerated version of a kind of betrayal that happens in people's lives from time to time. When that door opens up, is there anything at all that that young man can say? Can he hand them a big enough check? Can he show them beautiful grandchildren? Is there anything at all that he can do to undo the betrayal? Is there anything that he can do that would earn him a place in their hearts again? You know the answer to that question is no. The only way his relationship with those persons, with, with his parents, could ever be restored is if when the door swings open, mom and dad look at him and they say, we hate what you did. But we love you more than we hate what you did. And we will bear in our own being and our own hearts the ugliness of the sin that you committed against us. And we will not hold it against you, but instead we will take the pain. We will carry the burden of it. We will not require of you to pay anything. We will just open a place in our hearts for you again. Sin against God is like betrayal. And even if when we come to know that we need the Lord, there's nothing that we could ever do to fix the betrayal. And by the way, every time we sin, really sin, even after we're Christians, we're still betraying God. <coughs> There's only one thing that could ever restore us to fellowship with God. And Paul says it. God gave Jesus for us. For on the cross, my friends, there we have the Son of God, God incarnate, who stretches out his arms and he says to the whole world, do the worst you can to me. Pour out all of your hatred. Pour out all of the ugliness of human rejection of me and my Father. Pour it out on me. I will take it. I will take your guilt. I will take your sin. I will take your betrayal. I will bear it in my heart so that my Father and I can welcome you into our fellowship again. You and I couldn't sit in church tonight and have one hope of eternal life or one hope of knowing God if it weren't for God bearing everything that we have ever done, big or small. Every selfishness, every self-centeredness, every disregard for God, every self-seeking action, if God did not bear it in His own being so He could welcome us back into His heart. No wonder, Paul says, by grace have you been saved. Through faith, through just believing that God is this good, through just receiving what God has offered, and putting your trust in who God is and what He can do. For gr by grace are you saved through faith, and it is not the result of any work that you have done. Because our problem is not that our list on the positive side of the ledger is not long enough. Or the 
negative side of the ledger is too long. It is not about works. It is about just recognizing no matter what I could do, Lord, I could never span the chasm of betrayal. But if you have spanned it, if you have reached across to me, I will just say yes. I will acknowledge, not just when I begin to believe in you, but I will acknowledge every step of my journey of faith that it's only your grace and mercy that undoes the ugliness that my life would be if it weren't for your grace. It's only your grace that makes me even know that I need you. So I just say thank you, and here I am. Final reason we need grace is not because of how deep our problem is, but it is because of how high the calling of God is upon our lives. Paul, as he closes this passage, he says to the church at Ephesus, you, in the King James, it says, you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. To do good works. In the Greek language, that word which is translated workmanship, you know what workmanship is? It's what a craftsman creates. In the Greek, the word is actually poigema. It is the Greek root of the word poem. What is the calling of God for your life? Here in Kosciuszko, no matter how little you might feel, <clears throat> what is the calling upon our lives? No matter how insignificant we might think we are in the grand scheme of things, what is the calling upon the life of every church? Whether it's sitting on a hill like this one, or down in a valley like many churches where I grew up in the mountains, what is the calling of God upon our lives? The calling of God upon our lives is to be in this life all that God can make out of a human being. Not just to be forgiven. Not just to live in the hope that someday we'll go to heaven. But to live right now with heaven in us. To be God's poem. God's expression of himself. Or as the New Living Translation says, God's masterpiece. Your calling and my calling is to become like Jesus. Not because we grit our teeth and try really hard, but because we just say, I need your grace. And if your grace can change me, if your grace can really make out of me all that you want a human being to be, Lord, if your grace can enable me to bring true glory to your name, if your grace can allow me to represent the goodness of God to my neighbors and my family, if your grace can cause a light to shine out of my life such that when people see me, they get a little glimpse of how beautiful and wonderful Jesus is, if your grace can do that for me, if you can actually begin to make me your poem your expression of yourself in the world, then, Lord, here I am. Pour your grace upon me. Fill me with grace. Change me with grace. I don't want to just be forgiven. I want to be all that you want me to be. You and I could never become like Jesus. Ever. Ever. By trying really hard. But if Jesus begins to live in you when you have faith. And we say along with John the Baptist. You remember when they asked when his disciples said. John this guy Jesus that you baptized. He's got all these disciples going after him now. And they're leaving our merry band. And John just says. <coughs> he must increase. And I must decrease. God doesn't want you just to believe in Him. God doesn't want you to do things for Him. God wants you to receive Him and to do things with Him. 
so that the life of Jesus fills your life. That the possibilities of Jesus begin to be shared with you and me. That the love that was in Jesus begins to become my love. That the joy that was in Jesus begins to become my joy. <clears throat> that the peace that was in Jesus begins to become my peace. And the hope that was in Jesus becomes my hope. And the holiness that was in Jesus begins to become my holiness. Because Jesus is living in me. Oh, my friends, we need to understand what it means to live in grace. To live in the power of God's gracious presence that not only wakes us up to our need, that not only forgives us and restores us out of our betrayal, but God's grace that lifts us up and says, look what I want to make out of you. Let me make you a glorious expression of my will and my way. I know this much. There are people that you see every day <coughs> who need to see a Christian who's living like that. There are hopeless people who need for you to be consumed with the hope of God. There are joyless people that need to have the eruption of joy flowing out of your life and cascading over them. There are loveless people who need to be captured by the orbit of the love of God coming out of you. You're meant to be God's poem. Oh, open your heart to all that His grace wants to do in each of us. God didn't send Jesus just so you and I could be forgiven. God sent Jesus because He wants each one of us to know the joy and privilege and reality of being made like Jesus in our attitudes, in our desires, in our habits. Grace. We need it. And guess what? There's more grace than we can ever take advantage of. 